Tale of Two Hygienists presents this week's tipisode. Quick and easy tips to keep you up to date and presented by the experts in the profession. Now, get ready for your unofficial tipisode. This week brought to you by GC America. Hi, I'm Spring Hatfield and I am your host for today's tipisode. Today, I want to talk to you guys about saliva. It's an amazing bodily fluid, isn't it? We have come so far with salivary diagnostics where we can diagnose systemic diseases, both chronic and infectious diseases, through saliva. It prevents and protects our teeth, and it's just an amazing bodily fluid that is meant to do a whole lot more than what we give it credit for. So basically, whenever we see patients, we often think of saliva as something to protect the teeth as far as how much saliva we have. We, we worry about saliva flow and quantity, but I feel like there's a much bigger picture that we're missing a lot of the time, and that is the quality of saliva, because the quality of saliva is very important in managing oral disease. The composition of saliva is important in the inhibition of demineralization, buffering, and digestion. So we're not only talking about protecting our oral cavity, but also moving on to the GI tract as well. Saliva also has antibacterial, antiviral, and antifungal properties that protect us in a systemic capacity. So it protects us from infectious diseases and pathogens and all kinds of nasty bugs that could infect us. Fluoride, calcium, phosphate, and bicarbonate are some of the components of saliva that are of great importance regarding caries prevention. For instance, there have been multiple studies that indicate children with low levels of calcium and phosphate in their saliva are at an increased risk of developing caries when compared to children with adequate levels. I like to have these conversations with my patients, usually at the very beginning of the appointment. So when I start the patient's appointment, I like to review their medical history. As I review it, I take mental notes about things that may be an indicator of altered saliva composition. And while I'm starting the treatment, I I review the factors that increase the risk of caries and also what exactly altered saliva composition is. I like to do that at the start of the appointment because it gives the patient some time to kind of marinate on what I've said to them and come up with comments or questions or concerns that they may have. I also like to do that at the beginning of the appointment because at the end of the appointment, the dentist comes in and throws all these other big things with restorative and all that at them. And sometimes they don't get everything because everything's thrown at them at the end and all they're really focusing on is the restorative part and they don't really, really pay attention to the preventative things that I've had a conversation with them about. So I really like to do that at the very beginning of the appointments. Some of the contributing factors of altered saliva composition that you might want to look for when you're discussing nutritional counseling and different things like that with your patient as well as going over their medical history is what is in their diet? Because diet can alter saliva composition. Systemic diseases and shifts in the oral microbiome for a multitude of reasons, which could be a whole hour-long episode, so we won't go into all those, but let's do discuss who might be at risk for poor quality of saliva. And I think it's more patients than you might realize. So patients with type 1 and type 2 diabetes have alterations in the composition of their saliva. This has been indicated to increase the risk of not only dental caries, but also periodontal disease. Two separate studies have indicated a decreased level of amylase in diabetic patients. This has been attributed to hormonal and metabolic changes that go on in the body whenever patients have diabetes. And speaking of hormonal changes, what other patients might be at an elevated risk of having altered salivary composition? pregnant and postmenopausal women. A study comparing saliva from pregnant women to age match controls found, quote, salivary pH, bicarbonate, and potassium concentrations were reduced while sodium and phosphate concentrations were elevated in pregnant women, end quote. These findings suggested that pregnant women are at an increased risk of caries incident. Additionally, postmenopausal women often experience reduced salivary flow rate, but also have changes in the composition of their saliva, increasing their caries risk. The reduced salivary flow rate may not be significant in postmenopausal women. As a matter of fact, it may be so minor that they don't even necessarily notice it. 
But evidence indicates even in these cases, there are significant changes in saliva composition, shifting them into a higher caries risk category. So that's a large portion of our patient population. Oftentimes, we have many patients with type 2 diabetes. It's really a public health concern, honestly. And also, we have tons of pregnant patients. And if they're not pregnant, they're probably postmenopausal because women tend to go to the dentist a little more than men. But what can we as clinicians do to help bring this increased risk back down for these patients that are experiencing changes in salivary composition? Oftentimes, they don't even realize they're having these changes. First and foremost, we need to discuss these conditions and risk factors. Do not skip that part of your appointment. You can't throw things at patients to try to fix a problem that they don't even understand why it exists or how it exists or how it's applicable to them. So make sure you're not skipping over explaining that their salivary composition could be shifting. It could be changing. It could put them into a higher risk category for decay. And this happens a lot, especially with pregnant women. When I have them come in and they tell me, oh, I didn't have a cavity until I got pregnant. And then once I had my first baby, I started having all these cavities. And they believe, and we all hate this, but they believe that the baby is stealing their calcium when that is not the case. The case is really that they have altered salivary composition, which is causing them to be at an increased risk for caries. And we need to be having those conversations with them. And then we can offer them some solutions, and my favorite go-to solution, which is not necessarily the only thing, but my favorite is to offer these individuals a fluoride varnish whenever they're in my chair after their profi. It's quick, it's easy, it's immediate. They're concerned, well, some of them (laughs) are concerned immediately about this situation, this altered saliva, and they want to do something about it immediately. And, And we can do that right then and there and give them a little reassurance that they're making an effort to to make a change right away. Many hygienists that I've talked to really only utilize fluoride varnish for kids, and we know that that is just not evidence-based any longer. We have overwhelming evidence that is beneficial for adults as well, so we should certainly be offering it to our patients that fall into that high-risk category for caries. Another thing I'd like to provide for them that they can do on their own time in between their Provia appointments is a prescription toothpaste. And one of my favorites, because it really does address the saliva composition situation, is GC America. They offer not only a great varnish, which is MI varnish, that incorporates fluoride, calcium, and phosphate, allowing bioavailability of the calcium phosphate ions into the saliva, which changes the saliva, but also their pastes as well. The MI Paste 1 is one of the newer products that allows patients to use only this paste instead of needing to brush with regular toothpaste before applying the original MI Paste or MI Paste Plus. MI Paste 1 also provides calcium and phosphate ions in addition to fluoride, again, altering that saliva composition, which is what our big concern is. I feel like this adds an extra dimension to prevention because we're not just throwing fluoride at them. We're saying, hey, this has fluoride in it, but there's also calcium and phosphate ions that can help change the entire composition of your saliva, which is the original problem to begin with. And whenever I talk to hygienists about this, sometimes they often question verbiage because they feel like they're being a quote unquote salesperson. And what I would like to suggest is that if you understand your products that you're recommending and why you're recommending them, you will not feel like you're selling anything. If you believe in your products, if you believe in the ability of the product to provide the benefits that the product is being recommended for, you're not selling it. You're just giving a recommendation that can improve the patient's health. For instance, when you go to the doctor and they recommend a supplement, nutritional counseling, personal trainer, exercise regimen, anything that could potentially be a primary or secondary prevention strategy, do you feel like they are selling you something? Likely not. You probably view this as what it is, a way to prevent disease or disease progression. This is the exact same thing that is occurring when you do a proper caries risk assessment and make recommendations to prevent a disease or manage disease progression. Ultimately, though... 
This is the big thing. You must believe in the recommendations you're making. Otherwise, you will sound just like you're selling a product rather than advising patients on the best products to manage the risk of dental caries. So what verbiage should you use that makes you feel a little more comfortable? Well, assuming that you've went over all the information at the beginning of the appointment about salivary composition, risk, caries risk assessment, the whole nine yards, I generally say something along the lines of this. Considering your increased risk of altered salivary composition, I would recommend you consider having a professionally applied fluoride varnish at your Profi appointments. This is likely to reduce your risk of developing cavity by about 75%, which as you can imagine is very significant. You certainly don't have to do this, but I would be failing you as your dental hygienist. I did not discuss this with you. Additionally, you might consider a prescription toothpaste to provide protection between visits. It's as simple as something like that. You can say that to your patient, and by using this kind of verbiage, they don't feel necessarily coerced to do something. They don't feel pressured. They just feel like you're offering them the best thing for them so that they can help manage their disease progression or prevent disease from happening. And I also feel like it's the best way to introduce and further discuss the benefits of fluoride varnish and, and prescription toothpaste because even if they don't want it right then and there, they might have further questions about it and that gives you kind of an opening so that they can ask you questions and inquire about different things. And maybe even inquire about other products they've heard about or something like that so that you can kind of explain why this product is superior to another. But also you have to be prepared to hear the word no a lot in the beginning, but don't give up unless the patient, of course, explicitly states that they are against the use of fluoride varnish or prescription toothpaste or something like that. Otherwise, at each appointment, if according to their carriage risk assessment and their salivary composition assessment, they could benefit from fluoride varnish or prescription toothpaste, keep the discussion going. Your physician wouldn't give up on nutritional counseling and encouraging exercise and changing different habits just because you haven't lost weight between visits. Our patients deserve the same dedication. We are prevention specialists. We should be providing every prevention strategy we have available to our patients. Of course, they can decline, but that doesn't change our goal of trying to prevent disease. Thank you guys for joining me for this episode. If you'd like to reach out to me, you can reach me at my email, springhatfieldrdh at gmail.com. And until next time, you guys have a fantastic day. Thanks for listening to another Tipisode. And thank you to GC America for sponsoring this week's episode. You can find out more about their great products at gcamerica.com. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button in your podcast app. Follow us on Facebook or Instagram and head over to our website, atalatuhygienist.com to sign up for our newsletter. And we always appreciate ratings and reviews. Thanks again for listening to your unofficial dental hygiene podcast. <laughs>